So this is the session of healthy carers, just in case anybody's in the wrong room. Give me the chance to exit quickly now. Okay. We're a little bit um, running over five minutes already, so I want to um, make a start. So welcome to this session of sports and carers. We've got three speakers who will speak for 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a little bit of time to ask questions after they've spoken. If we don't fill that time, what I'll probably do is just nudge that towards the end, because sometimes people think of things at the end, and they want to speak to everybody. So we'll see how much time we've got to do that. Um, so I think we'll probably just crack on without further ado. So our first speaker is uh, Suji from uh, the University of Southampton. Um, and Susan, uh, NIHR fellow. <laughs> Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about supporting family members during the transition from hospital to home or nursing home for end of life care. Long time. No, time. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't quite planned short words. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So, I'm Sue from the University of Southampton, as you've heard. Um, I'm a nurse by background, by discipline, and my clinical <coughs> expertise is in palliative end of life care. And one of the things when I was developing services um, across hospitals in the south of the country, one of the things that called my attention was what we expect of family members when in hospital we're making a decision that this person is approaching the end of their life and is likely to die soon. And the expectations we have on family members for not just the care that they provide, but all of the organisation of that care and for doing it very quickly and getting the um, care environment either at home or selecting the nursing home for his life care and doing all of that while trying to support somebody that's important to them so broad definition of family but somebody that's important to them that they're committed to that they love while in hospital and they get called between those things at a time a very emotive time so this is um, the study that I'm going to explain to you is um, interesting. It's an implementation study. It's using solid, robust evidence that's been reviewed in systematic reviews and meta-analysis to implement support for family members in that transitional space between that decision to go home or to a nursing home for end of life care and discharge. So that's the purpose. We're interested in... Um, what that service framework would look like. In other words, if I was to describe to the executive group in the hospital what would need to be provided to support family members well during that time, what would be the resources, what would the intervention look like, what would they need to consider, what's the disruption to normal work, what would be the advantages, why should we do it? That's what we have been co-designing with um, our practitioner and researchers. And um, that would include a detailed description of an intervention that I'm going to tell you about today that we've designed from that evidence and the usability and accessibility of that intervention. So in other words, the factors that influence uptake of that intervention. So we're asking healthcare <coughs> professionals, nurses, doctors, occupational therapists, physiotherapists and so forth to use an intervention that has a family focus. So in of itself, that's a bit tricky. You know, as a nurse, I need to think really, really carefully about, am I just falling into healthcare ways, or is this something that's a bit different and is sort of have lots of um, social care support to help our thinking? But it's a big ask to, to transfer your discipline thinking to get something that's fit for purpose. And then secondly, what are the issues that stop that from being done? What's the contextual and discipline or resource issues that make that difficult. So that's our study brief. We now, um, it's an action, participatory learning and action research study consisting of four cycles, and we're in cycle four, which is the evaluation and um, re reflection on what we've learned, trying to pull that all together. So I'm going to present some of that to you today. We haven't quite finished our thinking on it is the short answer to that one, but then tell you where we've got to. And um, the rationale I've told you about something to go with there. So the plan is to give you an outline of how we went about developing the intervention, to give you an outline of that implementation and how we've done that and what we've learnt. So that's my plan. I've two plans here, I just have to dash over the other one. 
This is the first cycle then. So this was quite a long PLA cycle. We worked with um, uh, lots of social workers. We worked with lots of hospital clinicians. We worked with the PPI groups and family members that had been in this position um, to think about lots of things. Um, the first thing was when we started, when we put the bid in, we were thinking in terms in the healthcare literature, family members who provide care are called family caregivers. And what we learned from the PPI group <coughs> is that people that are providing care to people that are important to them don't like the word caregivers for lots of reasons. They don't associate it with them. So that's one of the things I've had to learn to really get my head around what is it about that that doesn't fit. Some of that is about wanting their knowledge of their family and the people that are important to them to be recognised. Some of that is about wanting the way that we do things as a family to be taken into account. Some of that is about people feeling undermined when they're talked about as being caregivers. That somehow or another what we do in healthcare is make family members pseudo-professionals and we forget all of the other things that are important to them or that they're trying to balance or that they're thinking about or that they're doing and so forth. So that's, that's another reason. In the healthcare literature, an alternative is suggested is thinking about family members as co-carers. Our PPI group and people that we talk to didn't like that either because they said that's still professionalising, it's still treating it like you would do it as a healthcare provider. We want you to do what you do as a healthcare provider, but that isn't all we are. Yeah. So that's another thing we need to learn. And the um, motivation that underpins a, a lot of family care is to try and keep things as normal as possible. And at End of Life Care, this is a different kind of normal, and things are normalised within that system of, of a family. But there's still this striving to, there's other parts of family life that are going on that we want to try and keep within the things that are important to us. So that's, that's one starting place that we had. Sorry, the other slide. Then we did three activities in that design. We first of all looked at the manuals from the studies that had been identified as being robust <coughs> in terms of supporting family members in palliative and end-of-life care. We looked at those training manager manuals carefully for what the active ingredients of the interventions that they had designed were. Originally, I was hoping we could take that intervention and use it, but most of those tested um, interventions were delivered in hourly slots over six weeks, and discharge from hospital at the end of life typically takes anywhere between a few hours to a few days. We haven't got six weeks. <coughs> And um, so we wanted something that was more pragmatic. So we looked carefully for the active ingredients, the things that made the tested ingredients work. And um, consistently what was demonstrated was it was important that we adopted a coaching model so we didn't tell people. When we looked at our practice as clinicians, we do a lot of telling, we tell people, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We'll get some equipment in, we'll um, make sure we'll make a referral so that we can get some social care and we'll refer you to um, the hospital service if that's appropriate, and we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this. We're not very good about saying, what, what ideas have you got about how we might manage this? So bear that in mind, because when we were teaching the intervention, that's something that is quite a big step for us to adopt, so a coaching approach, with the intention of helping people harness their own resources, so not to ignore the things that they're telling us we ignore, and to think through, to help people think through, to support them in thinking through what they might do about the things that are bothering them, what the concerns are, how they think they might go about solving the problems that are identified. So that's a careful review of the studies that were identified as being robust and the manuals that were produced for those RCTs in terms of active ingredients. And then we work with um, our clinicians and social workers and so forth to say, what would that look like? if you were to talk it? What would it look like if you were to have a conversation with somebody about it? So that's, that's one element of the work on the left-hand side. We needed, we, as we emerged through this work, it became increasingly clear 
that the theoretical foundation that we're referring to a lot was a health model about I mean healthcare, working with family members is about mitigating poor bereavement outcomes. So it's about reducing anxiety. And that's important, but it isn't it doesn't really work with what family members are telling us about what was important to them. So we did a thorough re review of available theories for us and we we use the family sense of coherence theory. Which says I'll tell you a bit more about that, but that's the theoretical foundation of our of our intervention. And then when we were working in the, I then went into the skills lab with that information with some with some colleagues to be videoed as a practitioner trying to do what the intervention that had been researched said in relation to what the theory family sense coherence says is important. So the family sense coherence says families' resilience is increased when they understand what's happening, when they can make sense of it, and when they can act in relation to it. And I couldn't do it. I was lost for words, literally. I'm quite experienced, I'm a nurse. I, I value the fact that I can communicate, but I couldn't do it. So we had to, I couldn't find the words that would make the intervention. And the reason why is because Although in my practice I've noticed families being very busy, um, I didn't know what they did. So we had to do a synthesis of the literature to identify what was known and went to people in our group to understand what activities did they do to get ready for caring for a family member. So that's our preparation work. And we sense of coherence, saying that it's important that people think about meaning, comprehensibility, and understanding and the resources. That's our advice. This is the work that families do. So that's our theoretical foundation. And the colours in this just map that we know that our theoretical basis works with the intervention and so forth. So this is a brief intervention. It's short, it's pragmatic, it's delivered to whoever is family, mm -hmm. to the person that's going home. And um, it focuses on family expectation. It goes in a very, in a very prompted way, it, um, it, is, it prompts practitioners about how to do it and what's about it. So we worked with three trusts to pilot the intervention. So we worked with a number of practitioners to implement the intervention in their everyday practice. That was to see if that, worked, that grew up in ways that it didn't work. And then we rolled it out to um, seven NHS trusts nine hospitals across the country um, <coughs> identified the different demographic populations wanted to try it out. So these are nurses, doctors, OTs, physios who meet family members of people going home. They use this brief intervention. Generally it takes five, seven minutes, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes divided up. They go through it, identify their concerns and then coach the family member about how they might go about doing that. Over the course of that, um, roughly 140 interventions were delivered. We supported the practitioners every month. We had a conversation about how implementation was going, and we did an evaluation meeting at the end, and then we also interviewed some family members who received the intervention. <coughs> the family member said, this is quite different to other conversations that we have with healthcare professionals, because it focuses on us and our needs. So good, that's what we hoped. And that it helped them with their decision making, it helped them to be able to make informed decisions about whether or not they wanted um, to what you know where the place of care was going to be. Because some people who thought that they wouldn't be able to support a family member going home, doing the intervention helped them think through what was what was worrying them and helped them to see, yeah, we could do this if we did this. And for some that were worried, they found actually we need another plan. So that's really good because that means that um, that transition of care is going to be sustainable. And um, in addition to which, the family members were glad of the other things that the healthcare professionals were thinking about, but it did help them think about this. We used um, an implementation theory, a social implementation theory, normalization process theory, in designing the study and in undertaking the evaluations with the um, practitioners. There were 58 pro researcher practitioners that we work with across the country. And in essence, um, their views fall like this. The intervention <coughs> makes sense. We're already doing family care. That's what they thought at the beginning. 
they implement it, try it out, and then they say, we were doing family care, this has helped us think about it completely differently. But the answers that um, patient and family members are giving us are completely unexpected. So that's good. There were things like, oh, that means that my mum is going to die in my home. How am I going to feel about that afterwards? These are really strong things that we wouldn't normally have picked up from telling them what things. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to do that for that reason, for example. One minute. And the things that influence it, so there's contextual issues that are both um, strengthening and not, but really quite importantly, that if the practitioners felt like um, this is interesting and useful, but we don't think we're the right people because this isn't our role, they nevertheless tried it out and said, we will work with others to make this work. Yeah. So that's that. And then the practitioners themselves have helped the intervention to change and to um, become more flexible. So sometimes an OT would phone up and say, Would you, can we come and speak? Things we want to speak to you about this. They might give them some homework to think about. Think about these things, come back and see them. I'm just going to run through this. So to acknowledge our funding, 58 co-researchers across the country and research in Southampton. Thank you so much. Got there? Yes, yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> 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 questions for Sue right at the moment. If we keep questions quite tight to questions. If there's discussion, we'll keep that for discussing with Sue. Margaret. Hello. Hi, Margaret. Um, I am a past carer not long ago, um, and I, I really went through this, but rather differently. So just throw it in for perhaps future questions. Uh, my husband was in hospital over Christmas, a very frail with advanced dementia, got him home, but then um, it was in conjunction with the GP that I established his advanced care plan, which you haven't actually mentioned those yeah. terms. Just throw it in because it was so incredibly yeah. useful. We made a decision that he shouldn't go to hospital again, yeah. so we had the community team involved, end of life. And for me, it was just so well managed. Um, I am an ex-nurse, so that probably helped my understanding. But uh, the, the situation was, by having an advanced care plan, um, it, it would then be known, because it would be on his record by the ambulance service, yeah. whoever had taken it to hospital again. Yeah. So I'm just throwing it in, I know we haven't got a lot of time, but I think we have to <coughs> realise that often this happens after they've gone home, yeah. um, and not as part of the care plan, because the hospital certainly didn't get involved. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, more or less. That's not the case, isn't yeah. it? Hospital and home is exactly. very separate. Whereas so, we were helping yeah. the practitioners to be thinking about home <coughs> work in hospital yes. and asking them to provide some kind of, you know, this, the support that I suggest. In transition. In that transition. <coughs> you know, that but it does happen if they go home, of course, yeah, yeah, of and course. even in the community, yeah. in, in, in a nursing home. Yeah. It's going to be the community team. Yes. So perhaps that needs to be highlighted that all that might start in hospital. Um, the, the input and the communication will be in the community and just raise that issue for everybody advanced care planning because it's coming in more and more mm -hmm. and it was so incredibly useful mm -hmm. everybody involved knew the situation thank you just one more quick question if anyone wants to yes. Yes. Um, Paul Morgan, I'm from the Bill and Cancer Support were other organisations involved at all in supporting the um, family caregivers? I know it's the wrong word, but... So, um, it depended. Um, quite a lot of... So this was a population of family carers with uh, somebody with all sorts of diagnoses. Um, sometimes if they had a long-term condition, they were already in touch with other people in the community doing that support, but oftentimes not. And um, when we started the study, the plan was to identify what support was needed um, for discharge and, and to bring that in. So it is part of the problem solving that I've been describing. Does that answer your question? Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think we'll we will move on because we'll we might catch up in maybe have a little bit of time at the end, but I want to make sure everyone gets enough time. So thank you very much, sir.
Um, okay, next up we have um, Chris Lloyd from the University of Bristol, and Chris is going to be talking to us um, about the issue of older carers. Uh, Chris from the University of Bristol, and um, I have another speaker on here, is it just you? Tricia, yes. Uh, Tricia's actually left our department now, as oh, okay. I did not run away with me. <laughs> well, researchers come to the end of funding and move okay. to another job, so, yes. Thanks so very I, much. Um, <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I've, I've got up at five o'clock this morning to get here on time. So it feels like afternoon. Okay. So um, this uh, research is um, uh, all about what we did, and you can't blame anybody else for anything I say. Okay. So, so we're going to be talking about um, this idea of parity of esteem, and uh, this idea is. Um, it, you, you see it, if you, if you look it up on Google, you'll see it relates a lot to the parity of esteem between mental health and physical health, or you know, other, other ways, or um, it also used a lot in education as well. But this um, is a, a quote from uh, Dame Philippa Russell, who's the um, chair of the Standing Commission on Carers, and it's, her, this quote is used on the Department of Health fact sheet on implementation of the CARE Act. So it's about the CARE Act. At last, carers will be given the same recognition, respect and parity of esteem with those they support. Historically, many carers have felt their roles and their own well-being have been undervalued and under-supported. Now we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be truly acknowledged and valued as expert partners in care. So this... Um, there's an awful lot in this, in this quote, and I just want to point out that, number one, the, the, the important point is that um, carers should be getting attention which they previously haven't got, and that's, that was the, the, the kind of main point of it, really. But um, carers have been, for an awfully long time, considered to be the sort of background resources, as um, uh, uh, Julia Twigg and Carl Atkin wrote about back in 1994 in their book, about carers and background resources is the way that an awful lot of people have treated carers and I, I think what you were saying earlier um, is, would, would bear that out really that in hospitals people just take, take advantage of those family there and then thank goodness family are there and we can just relax a little bit and not worry so much but there's also with all respect to um, Jane Philippa Russell who's, who I admire tremendously her quote also encapsulates a major problem with the way that we do perceive carers, which is that on the one hand, we're talking about parity of esteem with the people who are being cared for, so in, uh, in a sense they would be seen as uh, parity uh, on a par as clients of um, social services or other, other professionals. But on the other hand, they're also being expected to be seen as expert partners, so co providers of care, if you like. So there's a kind of, I think this, this kind of um, sums up for me um, quite a lot of the problems that are, are actually coming uh, to light, really, with the CARE Act, because we haven't really got to grips with the, the tension that there is between these two points of view. So in our study, we are looking at support for older carers of older people and looking at the impact of the 2014 CARE Act on that. Um, and um, we did this in uh, two different ways. Number one, we did a review of all the pages online related to carer support on the websites of all 150 local authorities in England, minus the Isles of Scilly and the City of London, or something like that, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, 150, so pretty much all of them. Um, but we also carried out four uh, case studies. So in local authorities who have responsibility for implementing the CARE Act, and um, bringing in uh, many of these changes to do with, um, uh, with carers. And um, we've done in-depth analysis of the documents of those um, four local authorities. We've done interviews with selected senior staff to get an idea about how they set about implementing the Act and where um, carers would fit into this and what would be the implications for older carers. We've done interviews with frontline staff who are responsible for carrying out assessments of need of carers um, and we've done observations of assessments of carers. We had planned to do actual interviews with the carers, but in fact, as it turned out, the, the observations of the carers' assessments um, actually provide us with opportunities to have conversations with carers, and many of them were, were very busy, didn't really want us to go back and do an interview, but we've also been in touch with them uh, subsequently uh, by telephone. 
We focus on older carers for particular reasons, really, and I, I think there are many ways in which this tension between whether we see carers as co-clients or co-workers, co-providers, if you like, um, there are ways in which that um, plays out for older carers, which um, I'm going to be talking about. Um, carers aged over 75 are particularly are distinctive in that there are more men than women. It's the only age group in which more men than women um, are carers. Um, they often take on caring when their own health is in decline. Um, they often have to take on um, tasks which are quite complex in terms of health care, uh, tasks that would previously have been done by community health staff, <coughs> often it's suddenly after discharge from hospital as well. Um, they're often uh, what, in what we call the heavy end of caring, which, um, which means co-residence with the person that they're caring for, so it could be you know, sort of, um, every, every hour of every day. And also, I think importantly, we can't assume that all older people are happy to care for the people that they live with. Right? We, you might have had an unhappy marriage, and this might be the final straw, um, and uh, so we, we, can't, we shouldn't make assumptions about that, but I, I fear that we do. So, um, that's the way that we, we set about doing this, and I'm focusing on just this bit of our, our um, research today, because uh, there's too much to say about all of it. But just to very briefly tell you that our sites were these four. Um, and obviously, these sites are, are confidential. We promise confidentiality, so I can't really say very much about where, even where they are in the country, because it would be so easy, wouldn't it, if I said which part of the country a large city was in. There's not, not many to choose from. So Site One's a large city with, um, where they decided to contract out all of their work with carers um, uh, to a specialist organisation. That included the assessments, and um, the um, support services as well. They made a decision as well with this contracted organisation that all the assessments of carers' needs would be done by telephone, not by face-to-face. So they had a very heavy emphasis on non-statutory involvement. Basically, you could see the state drawing back from um, sort of carer support before your very eyes. Number two was um, a middle-sized city. Um, where a, a local authority specialist team did um, carers' assessments. And their uh, support for carers was very mixed. Some of it came from the local authority, but not very much. Most of it was from um, NGOs and um, private care agencies. But there was a lot of um, very, uh, um, out, it's very outgoing work, if you like. There was a, there was a small group of um, very enthusiastic staff who went out literally into the marketplace to to um, reach out to carers. Um, in site three, which is a shire county, again, in the, the work with carers was contracted out to a carers organisation um, as, a, as a consequence of the Care Act. Um, they also had mixed um, uh, support for carers, some in-house, some not. Um, they kept uh, some in-house because they said we might contract out to a different organisation next time, so therefore we should maintain some of it. And um, they had uh, placed one of their local authority employees in the voluntary organisation that did the carers' assessments to help with data sharing, because it's a big issue if you contract out your um, services. How do, you, how do you share data, um, which is confidential? The fourth site is a coastal town, and they kept their services in-house in an integrated team. So they, ha- again, had a mixture of support, some, some with local authority, some with not local authority, but this, was, this uh, site was unusual in that the local authority had actually developed a new service for carers, which was entirely local authority funded and run, and that was a, a, a centre, a physical centre for carers. And they were also distinctive in this, the multidisciplinary nature of the teams as well. So we've got quite a nice variety there, and that's important because if you're looking at the implementation of a piece of legislation, you need to take account of local conditions. But even more so with this particular piece of legislation, because it was intended to iron out local differences and to end postcode lotteries. So um, what we found was that um, all of the sites said, we've not done very well by carers. Uh, We need to reach out more to carers. And so we need, first of all, to improve our data uh, on local care and populations. So they all said this to us. If you look at how many carers we've got locally by reference to the census data, and then you look at the, the numbers of people who have carers who have a care plan, 
there's a huge gulf, you know, so it would be a gulf of uh, tens of thousands. Um, and so they really wanted to um, improve their data on carers, but they also wanted to improve their returns to the, de to the Department of Health. So if they, so the, um, they wanted to make sure that the figures that they were presenting on the numbers of carers they were supporting made them look good essentially. So that was a, an, an important point. So these were important kind of drivers, if you like, that got people action, a, uh, active and the, you know, the senior manager tell us, you know, we've, got to, we've got to do something about this. So this was the really time when the local authorities said, we're going to do something. So whether, they, what, whether what they did was, was good enough is another matter, of course. So they wanted carers to come forward in early in their caring career. So they wanted to do more preventive work um, but they also wanted to, importantly, I think, uh, to raise awareness among social workers of the changed legal position of carers. So the changed legal position being carers uh, ex expanded rights to an assessment of their needs and their uh, legal uh, entitlement to um, services and support that they were, they were eligible for. So there we go. We've got um, you know, know more about carers, reach out for them and do better by them. Um, so doing better by carers was something that uh, a lot of them talked about. And they saw this work as part of their wider preventive agenda. Um, they wanted to promote direct payments and personal budgets for carers. They wanted to be sure they carried out more assessments. They wanted to link carers to community initiatives such as peer support and befriending initiatives. And they wanted to improve the information that they gave to carers and to provide more advice to carers online. However, they did not expect that there would be an increase in the number of carers with a care plan. So that kind of started to sort of ring a bell in my mind. But parenting esteem? Interesting. Okay. So this is part of what somebody explained to me, um, a, a who's a senior manager in social services. It's about the universal offer. So it's about what social services are generally offering the population that they live in, not about the specific offer. Um, uh, so they were not expecting to have um, any more uh, um, care plans, which would cost money, obviously. Um, and there were particular views about the doing better by older carers, mainly because we asked them what, they, what their views were. And I don't, I'm not sure that older carers had actually had um, a lot of attention uh, as a specific group. There's a lot more on the website, by the way, about younger carers, even though there are far fewer of them. So that's uh, an interesting point in itself. Anyway, but the first thing was, they said, well, the problem with older carers is that they don't identify themselves as carers. So I thought, well, actually, I, I, would, I want to question that, because are we saying that it's their fault, or you know, what's the problem here? But the, 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 important, the important point is you have to be identified as a carer in order to get the, um, the support, the access to the support services, uh, specifically um, uh, direct payments as well. They also said that some people have been refused assistance in the past and therefore don't come forward again when the situation that they're in gets worse uh, because they just think they're going to be turned down uh, for a second time and they can't be bothered with that. Um, there's also some stigma or fear surrounding social services. I, I don't know whether there are very many people left now who think that um, if social services are involved, they're going to kind of, you know, apply your services till you're blue in the face because, um, you know, anyway. But the, the fear was that people would think that if you have your needs assessed as a, a carer, what you'd be actually having assessed is your ability to care and the fear was that the person they were caring for might be um, going into a care home. This was, um, this was uh, um, what was told to us. Um, we were also told that some agencies um, that are contracted to provide uh, sitting services or home care services, particularly for people with dementia, are so poor that people don't bother to ask for them. They're just such dreadful services. Um, and um, lastly, often, when people are talking about support for carers, it's often directed at giving them a break away from caring on their own, and that that doesn't necessarily suit older couples who might want to have um, uh, uh, some sort of break together. So it's about the sort of the variation that there is. They all, 
wanted to um, improve their assessment of carers, but at the same time, as I said, two of the two of the sites uh, did all of their assessments. One minute, free. One, um, by unqualified staff, whether they were in in house or, or 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 not, and they talked about assessments as being uh, conversations rather than proper assessments. Um, and there were very few final point um, assessments of carers and service <coughs> users, um, which I think is a, is a is a major problem for this particular group. So. Okay, fighting tooth and nail. Okay, so this is what one of the frontline staff said to us. Older carers often have their own health needs and maybe mutual carers for each other. And they mean may need things like someone to do the shopping, someone to strip the beds, help with cleaning. And we can't put that in place. It's frustrating. You would have to fight tooth and nail to get money for that. So there's no flexibility in the system to actually carry through the idea of uh, of, of a kind of, of carer, support for carers being part of a preventive service. Um, and, um, okay, I'm going to give you the final, the final point here, um, which is um, parity of esteem. I think that specialist carer teams actually improve, impede parity, they stop it from happening. Um, <laughs> parity might be better achieved by joint assessments between um, carers and service users um, and recording systems that local authorities use should allow for individuals dual role as a service user and a carer to, um, to, uh, to be um, accounted for because at the moment if you're an older carer who has your own care needs you, you aren't counted as a carer you're only counted as a service user and we have this endless problem um, we have the, an endless problem I would say about not knowing whether we think carers are providers of a service or um, or uh, clients of the service. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Some <laughs> questions. And then try and keep them quite yeah. short and so who you are. I'm doing as much from the University of Salford. I do a lot of research with South Africa. Right. Is that the agenda? Right. Two questions actually. Do you still have one? And if no one else has got one, you can have another one. Now, you said that you wanted to inform social workers about change in legislation. I'm just promised the care acts been around and the authorities should have been practicing within. No, it wasn't us. This was the data that we were given by. Ah, the data that we were given. It was about um, upskilling social workers. That's why I was asking about it. So it's like, well, how much did we already know? You know, if they were already having responsibility, they will carry that care assessment. No, I know it's a really it's a really important point, but actually, I, it is a very important point because it distresses me no end. You know that, that um, the social workers don't take full account of carers and their needs, um, and that's been because in the past because service they had a statutory duty to service users but not to carers, but they somehow have had a real problem taking on this idea that they have statutory duty. Yes, but I don't think that the Care Act actually helps matters really. So. Take this example, a carer needs a break, the, the local authority says, okay, well that's going to cost money, so we're going to take this assessment away from this specialist team, and we're going to give it to the social work team, who have al they've already said don't do very well anyway. Suddenly, that carer's break becomes a, s a replacement service for the service user. It doesn't become a break for the carer, but it becomes a, a replacement care, which is then paid for has a budget and all that sort of thing, and it becomes paid for, and the carer will then be part of that kind of, it be an assessment of their uh, means, um, and, the, and they will have to pay for it. So the carer, who actually is seen as a, somebody who saves the state money by providing free, free care, then ends up paying for a, for a break from having that, you know, so they, that's the kind of, it's like you paying for your own holidays in a way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else got a, another question? Yes. Um, that's probably a question. I'm sorry, that rate applies to the University of Nottingham. Um, what will it take to actually make government policymakers listen to the preventative messages? Because oh. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, I was a quarter of a century ago, as an undergraduate, yeah. and I was reading stuff then 
that was telling us about and, and demonstrating with really solid research yeah. about the long term both cost benefits and social mm. benefits of early intervention and preventative work and social care. Mm. And here we still are, and no one really seems to listen. I know. We're rearranging the deck chairs constantly, aren't we, as the ship is sort of going down to the bottom of the sea. But I, I agree with you, and, and you know, I got a little bit depressed listening to Tom this morning, because I thought, you know, what's the I mean, point? What's the point of it all, really? Because we know, we know, we know about prevention, we know about what carers do, and I'm sick and tired of hearing the phrase unsung heroes, and politicians trot it out all the time. And I think there's too much singing, you know, we need a bit of action here. So, yeah, I, I think, I don't know what it is that we do, because I think the carers' organisations have been very successful at getting their voices heard, but it doesn't seem to make a difference in the end, because people will, this shifting around of the budgets is a, is a really, it's, it's, it's a major problem, I think. Okay, last one, very quickly. Uh, my name's Emma, I work for Real Road TPO in Tennis. Uh, what do you feel about empowerment and training for um, carers who aren't employed by, by the people that they are supporting? Um, I mean, to, uh, the, the, for them to do their role, I don't mean training in the practical skills of their role, they do that already, but to be more to feel validated, to be more vocal in their role, to be able to self-advocate? Well, I think you've hit on something that's quite a tricky thing for this particular group of carers, actually. Um, and That's why I asked. Yes, <laughs> which is also why I think I'm, I'm coming to a conclusion, although I, I couldn't honestly say that I could come to a conclusion based on my data from this, but it's, it's this project in the context of other things as well, which is that for this group, it might very well be that the best way of supporting the carer is to provide better services to the person they're caring for. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. However, I do think, see, I, I said to somebody, I don't think it's really fair that if a carer wants a break, it becomes a service that, 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 that they then have to pay for. She said, no, they don't pay for it. The service user pays for it. I said, it's for their couple. You know, <laughs> you know so, so if, if my partner pays for something, it has an impact on me as well, doesn't it? So, um, I write support plans. I totally so, she said, so she said, but it would be unfair if that service user got a free service because they got a carer, when a, a person who hasn't got a carer would have to pay. I said, well, that's only if you see that service as being a service for the service user and not a service for the carer. Mm -hmm. That's, you see, and, and we go around in circles on that, and I think every <coughs> time um, we have a new piece of legislation, because people need to save money, they go through this and work out how they can do it so it costs them the least amount of money. And that's, I'm afraid, the bottom line of it. So I'm not awfully keen on the idea of training this group of, of carers to be more assertive as carers, because I don't think it's going to get them anywhere in the end. Chris, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Nicola Brimcombe, based here at LSE, and I'm going to talk, I'll give a brief overview of our project on the role of adult social care in improving outcomes for young people who provide unpaid care. Um, the rest of the project team are Derek King, Martin Knapp, and Magdalene Stevens. Okay, so a bit of background. Um, the project uh, looks at um, young people aged 16 to 25 providing unpaid care to adults. The majority of um, young carers, sorry, the majority of young people providing unpaid care at this age are providing care to adults. Um, and we're looking at this group um, because there's evidence of ne negative consequences uh, in terms of their education, employment, mental and physical health with a likelihood um, associated um, individual and societal cost. This is a, f uh, a photograph taken by a young person um, in our study. Uh, it's her and her father called The Love You Get in Return. Um, we're also looking at this age group because it's an age of transition for many young people in their lives at this age. Um, 
in their education, leaving home, um, getting a job. Um, but for, for young people with caring responsibilities, this can make transition much more problematic. Um, also at this age, there's a move between different services, so from children's services to adult services, um, which makes it a particular age of interest. Um, picking up actually on something on what um, Liz said, uh, we're looking here at the role of services for the person with care needs in supporting that young person. Um, the reason for that is it's um, a key concern and need expressed by not just young people themselves, but the organisations um, that support and represent them. Um, Children's Commissioner report talked about a lack of services for families uh, where there's a young person providing care in it. Um, the Care Act, uh, one of the rights it has given, is the right for a carer to have services, um, no, the right for, care, uh, for services for the person with care needs directly to support the carer. Um, we're, we're, this, uh, the other reason for this, we're looking at the dual fo focus of caring, that there is a carer and a person with care needs in any caring relationship. <clears throat> we did previous research funded by um, SSCR that looked at working age carers and found evidence that they support them to stay in employment. Um, lack of services also make transition particularly difficult for young people. It's very difficult to um, leave home if the person you care for isn't receiving any services either. They have no care or, or, or in many cases it's a younger sibling who has to pick it up neither of which is a very comfortable situation. So we're looking at um, associations between re receipt of formal um, paid care for adults with care needs and outcomes for the young adults who provide care for them, the needs for these services um, and the costs of providing them. The outcomes we're looking at are the ones I mentioned earlier where we see evidence of um, the negative impacts of caring but also they're the ones identified in legislation, uh, the Care Act in particular, but also Children and Families Act. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about um, how we've involved uh, users and carers and practitioners to date. So um, we talked a lot with Carers Trust and um, some young carers when we're developing our proposal um, uh, a lot around the methods and how we, how we might run the advisory groups. Um, they've been involved in the development of the research materials. We've got a young carers advisory group who um, went through the questionnaire, um, had some incredibly helpful um, suggestions about what should be in it, how we should word it, and we changed it accordingly. Um, as well as our young carers advisory group, uh, we have another separate advisory group which is people from service user organisations, um, Carers Trust and the Children's Society, Department of Health, NHS England um, and people from local authorities. Uh, last year we went to the Young Carers Festival um, and uh, as well we asked people to, we asked young people to fill in our um, questionnaires but we also had some very interesting conversations particularly with um, people working in local authorities with young carers, often voluntary organisations, uh, because a lot of it's been contracted out of local authorities. Um, so we've looked at, um, these are our methods, we've, we've analysed um, data sets that are already out there, the Health Survey for England and Survey of Carers in Households, and we've done our own survey of young people who provide um, unpaid care, and I'm just going to go through some of the preliminary results. We're midway through the project, so we're not done yet. I'm just reporting on the health survey for England and our survey today. So this is the health survey for England. Um, the red are where there's a statistically significant difference between the two groups. On the left is the young uh, people who are providing unpaid care to an adult, and on the right, those who aren't. Um, and you can see that they're less likely to be in employment um, have a slightly lower well-being and um, poorer health. It's all self-reported apart from being in employment. And then our survey, we ask questions about if their employment, their education, their health and their social life is affected by caring. 
in um, different ways and you can see um, a high proportion of them felt they were these areas of their life were. So then we looked at um, what were their outcomes like if uh, the person they cared for um, received services um, because we can see these big impacts of caring and we got this result which is um, contrary to what we might have expected if the person they cared for received services the carer was more likely to report um, that their employment was affected and more likely to report that their health was affected if services were received compared to not much higher for employment, uh, over four and a half times more likely. This is the Health Survey for England, but we found the same in our, um, in our survey of young people um, uh, for education. They don't ask about education in Health Survey for England, but we found it for education and for employment um, that so they were more likely to feel these areas were affected by caring if the person they cared for received services. Also health, but that's not statistically significant. So, although there are substantial impacts of caring and um, at high hour, uh, and, and actually this is associated even more so with higher hours of caring, so you might expect services to, um, to make things better. Um, it appears not to be the case. So we looked a bit further into this, and one of the things we looked at was that um, services are, are indicative, particularly in this climate, of, of high care need, and um, services are associated, uh, a person's more likely to get services if care needs are higher, um, but maybe uh, the services received were not enough so to, to meet all that need, and therefore you still get impact. And this is more or less what we found, that... Um, if the person with care needs uh, didn't receive enough services, uh, this is just talks about amount, I'm aware there's other insufficiencies of services, but if um, they didn't receive enough services, um, education, health and social life were more likely to be affected by caring. Um, and let's hope this works. It does. Um, the other measure we looked at, there's a question in the survey, in our survey, that says, um, if you wanted a break during the time when you usually look after the person you help, is there anyone whom you could rely on to look after them, either at home or elsewhere? So this could include formal services, but it could include a family member or um, somebody else. But we figured that if you can't leave the person, if you've got nobody to leave them with, then you're clearly, they are not getting enough support. And unsurprisingly, the ones in red, again, are significant um, if there's no one you can rely on, your employment and your education are affected by caring, which is kind of more, more affected by caring, which is kind of obvious because if you can't go out to work or you miss school and so on. Um, but um, uh, also you, you, uh, you're, you have higher um, symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, you express less positive aspects of caregiving and uh, you have lower well-being. So, uh, quick, thank you. To summarise, um, we do see um, that a substantial proportion of young people providing unpaid care report that their employment, education, health and social life are affected by caring responsibilities, particularly compared to, uh, well, compared to young people of the same age without caring responsibilities. <coughs> and they, um, experience high levels of depression, anxiety and stress. They do report some positive aspects of um, providing care, but more so when that is shared, have someone to rely on. It's not, as other research shows, it's, it's not unmanageable. Um, it's not too high um, intensity. Um, the role of services appear to be associated with higher likelihood of them reporting um, negative effects of caring. Um, why is that? Well, as I said, we've just looked at that um, it's an indication of care need receiving services, but the services are not enough to meet that need. There may be um, uh, 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 that, this, that we haven't seen the positive effects of services yet, or that they've come at a point maybe 
too late in the young person's life, particularly in terms of critical periods in their education or when they're developing mental health problems, suggesting that we need more than just services and we need to think about early intervention and prevention and all those things. Um, it's possible that there are some difficulties associated with receiving services. We, we do see this particularly for this age group. People are really worried about being separated from their family and their family being split up, people being taken into care. There's a lot of stigma around uh, the, the, the social care um, for young people. And, um, or, and, uh, or it may just enable them, I think particularly young people, they've been caring often or, as long as they can remember and they've normalised their situation. And sometimes the process of having to get services, have assessments, enables them or raises quite difficult feelings about their situation that they may not have been so aware of before. So we plan to discuss this with our advisory group, got a young person's advisory group in the next few weeks, but any thoughts um, on this? Um, and just, um, I think that what we found so far, as I say, we're midway through it, but um, the the needs of young adult carers do appear to differ from those of the working age carers we looked at. We found opposite relationship in terms of employment with working age carers. So for me, this reinforces it is a particular age of interest um, because of all the things I was saying before, life transitions and length of caring and maybe caring during critical periods in their lives. Um, there are obviously other groups, older carers um, being one of them, but. Um, but I think, uh, the, so the overall thing of that is that there's definitely a range of carer needs and care recipient needs and experiences. Um, that, so we need to um, consider carefully that people have different needs from services and different experiences of them. Um, as I said, it's an early stage, so um, we think there may well be more um, Implications for policy and practice and research, um, and but we'll be guided in this with our advisory groups and some workshops we'll be holding around September, October. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for me? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Nick Masters, and I've, I've been a carer for like two and a half decades. Uh, I know the game. And the reality is what you've not spoken about is the commissioning process in everything that we've discussed today. And none of you have spoken about the commissioning process. Without money, without commissions, uh -huh. nothing is going to happen. One. Two, we have worked on this as a collective uh, group of people, caring people. And the result was values-based commissioning. It's never been applied across the board. For example, if you can show value to the money that is being spent by a local authority or the NHS uh -huh. itself, initially, England. And I think uh, Jeremy Hunt said that yesterday, you know, we need the professionals to prove their value and their worth. We don't need to prove we are carers, yeah? Mm -hmm. We don't need to go out and show you how good we are. It doesn't matter. You have to come and show us how good you are because you're a public service provider. You're paid by the public money to provide the service, which is Sadly, for whatever purpose, I'm not going to get into the argument there. I do know the uh, answers there, but I'm not going to get into it in this session. But the reality is there is absolutely no collation between the way the professional thinks or the care. There's no collation. It's all, yeah, 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 it's cool, cool, cool. Then one, why is the money not there? The money, there's a lot of money. You know, it is not spent correctly. It is not used correctly by the right people. For example, look at the amount of care... Uh, agencies around the country, third sector, whatever uh, you know, you want to call them. Where is the pr pr provision for the carer? I have a daughter who's gone through exactly what you're saying. No mm -hmm. help or no support mm -hmm. in all her life. I had to actually implement a process nine years ago in my local authority, go and go into schools and teach kids of what it meant to be a carer. How? Why should I do it? But I did it. No. Why? Because I'm a carer. I mm -hmm. care for people who care. End of story. The reality is we are not looked at as part. We just looked at as someone who's a buffer, who's just doing the job because, hey, he, he can be used or she can be used. We are not looked at as equals. And we have a you know, triangle of care. The lady spoke earlier. Triangle of care applies to exactly what you were saying, madam. Equal partnership, equal platform. Service user, carer, and the provider. End of story. Be transparent. Be real. Whatever 
you know, stuff you're talking about, you spoke to this one, you spoke to that, that one. Did you speak to the people who give the money? No. Why are they not giving the money when it emphasizes that these kids who are 16 to 24, whatever age is. So, mm -hmm. your question did yeah, about the speak to the... Yeah, have you talked to commissioners? My direct question. Um, have we talked to commissioners? We have them on the advisory group, but no, that is this. Thank is you. End of story. But, okay. <laughs> Does anyone else have another question? Yeah. Um, I think about Could you say your name? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Andrew sorry. Richardson, um, I'm a, an independent social worker. Um, I suppose it's, it's a comment and a question. Um, I think I'm a bit concerned about the um, conclusion that you make, um, even if it's tentative with lots of caveats about the association um, between having um, services and having neg that having negative impact mm -hmm. on this group. Um, because I think you said um, that there was the bit about how much service perhaps being indicative yeah. of the care. So mm. that to me seems like a really, really important point that needs to sit above actually mm. the, the conclusion that you make because we're in a context where um, people are, uh, the, the policy makers and commissioners, the you know, like being talked mm. about, will, will jump on that. Right. And say, well, actually, if we give people services, they end up with worse outcomes. Yeah. Know, so we need to be really careful. <laughs> yeah, and I know. Actually, with that yeah. kind of control, yeah. I just try to flip it or not say it somewhere. <laughs> 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 I mean, that. It, it could be the other way around. It could be yeah. if they're having more difficulties with, let's say, their employment, their health, their services are um, being triggered by that. And that's what I mean about care need and so on and so forth. I don't think that's the case, but I, I, I think we need to consider, um, we need to kind of think about why we see that relationship because it's very, I mean, it, it isn't what you'd expect. And I don't, I'm not arguing at all that services are having a negative effect. And that's why I think we, we looked at sufficiency. So that does seem a very plausible explanation that they're just not getting enough services. And when they do, things are better, as you can see from that table there. But I'm aware it's, <laughs> but it's you know, I'm not trying to make the argument for less services by any means. We're host, just to add, we're hoping to do some interviews um, to kind of get to the bottom of why this might be, but I will present that very carefully. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of pondering um, that too and thinking, oh no, we want it to show a different relationship. Yeah, but, yeah. but if services are involved, that means the fact that the carer is yeah. then coordinating all the services. Yeah. And that's another right. that's another responsibility. Mm. And, um, and in the best world in the world, sometimes those services don't come when you think they're going to come. And it could, there are other things related to it that are disruptive. In, in that sociological mm. sense. Like, and we know that's yeah. a huge issue yeah, for yeah. people who self-fund care for older mm. people. Mm. Their coordination yeah, services yeah, is quite stressful for them. It could be that. But equally, there could be positive effects that we aren't picking up in, um, by these things. And, um, and, and I think, as I said earlier, it may just be that they need to be earlier and more of them. Um, Two questions only. Mm. Uh, Sharita Sain from King's College London. I think there is a huge confounding effect here. Uh, and I think you have to highlight that. So um, the, the type of, you know, the, type, the level of care needs that the person in need of care mm. is getting at, you have to have it. So you have, I think you have to do, and I'm sure you will do that, your analysis to control for these have. confounding effects <coughs> clearly and show. Mm. Because when you did that, it mm. shows the opposite effect, actually, really having sufficient level of services, mm. it's helping. Mm. So I think this is your message, and we have to under estimate <coughs> The whole other issues of coordinating, of, mm. it, it's a nightmare for an mm. adult, mm. let alone for a younger person who has to juggle a lot of things and their transition as well. So I think it just, again, I'm a bit worried mm. about the, the, the results because it just basically, people have to have more, you know, men, you know, this is a traditional kind of epidemiology question in the 70s men have more cancer than women, mm. so it must be. It must to be something to do with gender. If it's mm. not, it's a smoking habit. Mm. So you were you were really clearly not mm. looking at, mm. at something. But mm. you are you are looking at but just ensuring that this is the message. Mm. You can get the right services that are sufficient for the needs. Then things would improve. But obviously there are huge gaps when you have a lot of needs. Mm. And, and also if you're getting 
Jewish services, and I don't know if you can capture that. So people having service from uh, social care commissioned by the local authority, they're mm. under a very <coughs> income as well, mm. and poverty, mm. rather than self-funding. And again, that has mm. other problems uh, for the security of Bayard persons. Mm. They are drawing from their financial mm. savings. I think with your interviews, you can mm. unpick this, mm. but also with your quantitative analysis yeah. to, to yeah, we do control for things like care needs and gender and ethnicity and things like that, and we still see that. But um, definitely, we kind of take all those factors on board, and, um, and we do see evidence for that. But equally, I think if there is something difficult about receiving services for young people, when you hear them speak, they are really worried about being taken into care, but that is a good, something we need to know in implementing those services. We can't really, uh, we have asked in previous services where people get the services from and people honestly often don't have no idea who's providing it. They just know that somebody arrives and what that Final question for you, John. Um, John Wall King's College. Um, it was just, uh, uh, Sue's probably <coughs> kind of my, my point earlier, but I just wondered whether, mm. something about the transfer of responsibilities mm. over the last few years for the advent of direct payments and personal budgets. Um, and whether some of the people that took part in your work mm. um, have, have been, you know, juggling some, as it were, unacknowledged financial responsibilities, mm. Mm. you know, pertaining to the budget. Um, I work I did a couple of years ago. Um, what we found was that there, there were a bunch of people um, who were caring for other people, who were actually managing the direct payment of, of, of the person who was actually formally the owner of the budget. So right. it was all going on under the wire, as it were. Yeah. And I wonder that might be, whether mm. that might be one of the reasons for your, your puzzling outcomes. Mm. Mm. That's definitely something that we could ask, mm. because it's around this link to care management and some yes. of those sorts of things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much. So, uh, uh, thanks Nick, I thought we've just got a couple of minutes, so I just wondered if anyone had any questions that have been occurring to, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> occurring to them about maybe the earlier talks. So, I had a question for Sue, actually. You just said you off. Sorry, I have Jennings from um, the University of Reading. Uh, and the question really was about um, the impact of preparing families for the end of life. Because I'm a paramedic and I teach paramedics yeah. and that's my background. Um, did it have an impact for the families more, be more prepared for the end of life? Did that have an impact on the use of 999 emergency paramedic services? Was that looked at or was yeah. that considered? No, it would be nice to know all these things, wouldn't it? But being an implementation study, we were, we were not testing those kinds of things. But what, what I can answer the question by saying is that we are confident from the interviews with family members and from the practitioner data that family members taking you know this work on were um, more informed about what it would involve and more more as a consequence of that I completely much better understood that it was about to be done and what they needed to think about in, in order to be ready for that. So what services like for example one the question about what have you talked about this as a family? What concerns have it just raised? One of our practitioners gave the example of I'm really worried about what to do when my family member dies and so it then raises that kind of thing. Okay, here are, these are practical but um, hugely significant emotional concerns that family members have that then get dealt with prior to discharge, which increases the informed consent, or at least gets somewhere near consent because that tends not to happen. So I can't answer it with data other than what Peter said. Can I just make a yes. comment about that, that very point actually? Because um, as you can imagine with our age group, quite a number of people were caring for people who were at the end of life. And during the course of it, um, we had people die, you know, mm -hmm. who, that um, we were uh, with, uh, just after the care assessment. And um, in the one case, there, were, uh, there was a, the local authority um, commissioned a service that supported the care for a year after the death, which was really important for, for all of the kind of practical things as well as the emotional things. Um, but, but in another one, um, I, I asked, I put in follow up interview, I was a follow up telephone call with the, uh, the um, frontline worker. I said, What, what happened to the, to, the, to the man after we assessed his knee and his wife's death story? And he, and he said, oh, I have no idea. 
I've no idea. You know, <coughs> that, that really struck me as quite significant, a significant difference, really. And the one is kind of recognise that you, it doesn't, things don't stop up and left. That's and, right. And, and you've had other services. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the final question is if you were. Um, yeah, all of us University of Bristol. I had a yes. question, question for Liz uh, about your, one of your critical points is just about special care teams could impair parity between MPs. MPs. Impede. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I just wonder whether you could. Because, because what we have is um, a, a team of workers whose focus is solely on the carer. And then if anything comes up where there seems to be a need that is best met through support from the service user, it's handed over. So there's no kind of, this just, just really what I just said about the end of life. Yes, yeah. There are no ways in which that team is, has an ongoing interest in the, in the well-being of the care. Yeah. And uh, so I think in terms of parity of esteem, that's a real, that's a gap, you know, it's a real serious gap. So you don't, they don't know whether the service that was provided to the service user actually did have the positive benefit to the carer. They have no idea. No way of knowing it. Well, I think just two minutes over. But um, thank you all for your contributions. Can we thank the